that might have manifested itself. The first is the example of taxation, because I'm sadly fascinated by the history of taxation. Remember, in the 18th century, that most, well, all forms of tax, whether it was land tax or whether it was excise or customs, was collected and often negotiated in person. The excise collectors had manuals and rules that they were meant to follow, but basically, personal encounters with your tax person um, and often forms of negotiation, particularly over land tax, were not uncommon. The introduction of income tax changed all of that. And I say this, I'm filling out my tax forms at the moment. Income tax is first introduced in the middle of the Napoleonic Wars to try and bring more money um, for the war effort, but it lasts just three years. It runs from 1799 to 1802. It's not reintroduced until 1842. And the key thing about income tax is that it creates an it's not that it's, it's, I mean, there's two key things. Obviously, income tax is important because it's a gradated form of, of taxation um, and it's not uh, a tax on sales, which tends to hit the, the, the poor most heavily. That's one important element of it. Um, the other important element is the system of collection. Okay, so in now, what you had, just uh, if any of you filled out taxation forms today, you'll know you have a series of schedules of paperwork that you have to fill out. It's a bureaucratic process. You fill out forms, you send them in, you never meet the person who is taxing you. They remain utterly anonymous to you. It's a completely um, blind bureaucratic process, if you like. And this is the system that was introduced um, in Britain in 1842. Remarkably, that entire system of paperwork was operated by just 361 surveyors and inspectors by 1870. Okay? Contrast that to the 2,000 plus excise men that were running around the country collecting tax in the first decade of the 18th century. Now, I don't want you to think that all taxation suddenly becomes bureaucratic and by form and you, know, you have a faceless system. Because land tax, obviously taxing the rich, they still need their people because the, the rich need their special privileges. So it's not until the 1920s that taxation of land becomes um, uh, uh, fully incorporated into this new faceless bureaucratic system. So that's my first example. My second example is the Ordnance Survey. Basically, state mapping. Again, this project begins with the Napoleonic Wars. So having said, oh, this has got nothing to do with war, the state developing its capacity during war, I'm now giving you two examples of how the war is actually pretty important. First Ordnance Survey begins in 1791. Um, and what it does is map out the coastland of Britain to protect it um, so it could be better protected from French invasion, which was obviously going to be by sea. Um, uh, it gets introduced in India in 1817 and in Ireland in 1824. Um, and, and the key thing about the Ordnance Survey is it seems like a, the application of a new type of scientific approach, the science of cartography. By 1841, the Ordnance Survey Act gave this state body called the Ordnance Survey the power to do pretty remarkable things. It allowed it the power to collect and standardise place names. So Britain and, Britain and Ireland is a, a, a countries with enormous varieties of local dialects where names of places would have been um, orally transmitted and could have been spelled in any, different, any number of different ways. The Ordnance Survey basically fix, fixes how your locality was going to be known. That's the first thing it does. Um, and that meant basically in Wales and Ireland and Scotland the eradication of Gaelic or Celtic names. It also enabled the state to define and fix property and administrative boundaries. That's a pretty amazingly um, uh, new thing to be able to do. And finally, and this is why I've given you this image, although I'm not sure that you can see it that well, it gave uh, the Ordnance Survey the ability to make all public places visible, including their interior. So what you see in this image is actually the interior of the church and uh, a bank in central Manchester. But you can actually count how many pews are in that church. By 1892, England and Wales was being mapped on a scale large enough for the state to be able to determine the size of every door set, every front door set of every house. My final point, example here, is going to be the census. Now, we know that Britain was rather late into the census field that America um, uh, was in, in, the, in the vanguard. Britain doesn't get its first census until 1801. And what it does was provided a list of the address, the family size, the aggregate you know, family size, the age and occupation of, um, uh, 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 of people. And critically, that, ordinance, that um, census was collected by parish officers, i.e. the Anglican church became the medium through which the state collected this knowledge of its, local, um, of its, of its population. That census, though, was nonetheless gave an official in London the ability to know how many people lived in what locality, however far away they may have been. And that was an unprecedented degree of knowledge that the centre had about the localities. In 1836, a new type of government office is created called the General Registrar's Office, the GRO, um, and it takes over responsibility for the running of the, the, the census. Um, uh, by 1841, it has 35,000 local enumerators doing the work of, of, of collecting returns. And importantly, the General Registrar's Office also takes something else away from the church, or rather in addition to the church. It, now, you have to register all births, deaths and marriage with the state through this office. Up until this point, only the Anglican Church collected that um, information. So, the point I'm trying to make here is not just that the state gets new data, or it has new forms of collecting that data, but that this data enables a different type of state. It enables the state to think and act in ways that it wasn't possible to do. And critically to that, it enabled this process of governing strangers that you didn't have to know. Now, this mapping of population and territory went hand in hand with the proliferation of statistics, the collection of statistics by the government to do, I mean, basically they counted pretty much everything they could think of, they could count. Um, and again, just like the census, this, collect, this statistical collection was about trying to gain knowledge of particular local activities and putting it into a general overview, okay, so that you could abstract the knowledge of how many people died in a mine in South Wales and connect it to accounts of how many people died in mines right across the country. Okay, so now you're no longer dependent on a single individual to say, oh, well, in Abergavenny there's five people died this year. Now you have an overview knowledge of that entire process across the country. 
And what they did was they tried, they thought if they had that universal view of these processes, they would be able to discover the natural laws of population growth, of trade flows, of rates of crime, spreads of diseases, even the state of the military health of the population. Okay, so a whole number of things that before could only be comprehended in this local basis now became amenable to a new type of analysis and understanding. And key here was the growth of statistical knowledge generally. Um, you have in the 1830s a number of new types of statistical societies emerging. The first is in Manchester in 1833. The Royal Statistical Society in London is formed in 1834. And around that same time, you see the Board of Trade beginning to set up its own statistics department to m measure flows of trade. You have a new type of electoral register, counting the number of voters. And in 1834, you get a new type of poor law return, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And then in 1836, the General Registrar's Office, um, uh, counting everybody and everything. Now, this type of knowledge enabled people like this man, um, uh, uh, Edwin Chadwick, to present themselves as having expert knowledge in particular fields. And government became, began to follow a common process. You would have an expert say, OK, I know all about public health, or I know all about the, I've studied the, poor, the, the operation of the poor laws. We're going to set up a government commission that will collect all the information that we can. We'll have witnesses from around the country, et cetera, et cetera. And then we're going to pass legislation that will impose new types of regulations across the country as a whole. And then we're not going to stop there. We're going to create an inspectorate, a whole bunch of government inspectors that would then run around the country checking on the condition of mines, of factories, of the operation of the poor law, of the operation of sanitary laws, and eventually the implementation of education issues. All of these things were new from the 1830s um, uh, onwards. Now, one thing that you'll begin to note is that all of these areas of work involved social issues, social problems. And one of the key things that this type of work did was to separate out these issues from economic issues. So, for instance, poverty and public health, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, are now considered to be issues not about the malfunctioning of the economy, but about social issues with their own internal dynamics um, and laws that could be operated to be um, perfected. What you'll also note is that these social problems invariably entailed the identification of individuals who had failed to become these ideal liberal subjects, the poor, the unsanitary, the ignorant. These are the people who become subject to these new types of government intervention. So as I said, this massive extension of government power that begins to develop needs a new type of justification in the science of government, and it needs a new type of administrator. Okay, you can no longer have this new scientific approach operated by the old f officials corrupted, I mean, that were part of the system of old corruption, appointed by particular ministers or by the monarch, etc., etc. So what happened was the development of what became known after the North Coast Revenue Report as the civil service, the idea that you could have government administrators that were independent from government civil servants that would operate the state regardless of the political point of view of the government in power. Okay? This is not a system that pertains so much in, in this country where you know, every presidential election leads to a whole new population in Washington and all their special advisors you know, come in to, to do that work. In Britain, you have a permanent civil service that was set up at this, at this point. Now, here's a key point in which the empire was the laboratory for these ideas. Because the East India Company, in a way, you know, at the heart of that old system of old corruption, um, the old mercantile institution, you know, where Hastings had been flailed for his, his poor behaviour by birth, the East India Company had actually had something that anticipated this. It recruited and trained its officers. Okay? They were selected. It wasn't a competitive process of selection. They were, you know, selected by personal connections and, and, and knowledge. But they were streamed into different elements of the administrative service by a competitive exam. So once in, they took exams that would decide what they were going to end up doing. And one of the key figures here are, is um, Charles Trevelyan, this rather dashing man that you'll be hearing uh, more about on um, Thursday. His brother-in-law, Thomas Babington Macaulay, the famous um, uh, uh, historian who wrote a big three-volume history about the history of England, uh, published in 1848, um, had reformed the East, East India Company's administration in the 1830s. And Trevelyan um, uh, had, um, ha had returned to India. He had a period of time in London, where you're going to see him on Thursday, managing the Irish famine. But after that, he goes back to, to, um, uh, to, to India and introduces competitive exams for selection of the East India Company in 1852. Okay, and this was meant to be able to open up the um, uh, uh, administrative service to, um, uh, to, uh, to indigenous Indians, but the exams were conveniently held in London. So that was a pretty hard place to get to. Um, the, fo the following year, in 1853, Trevelyan co-authors this report that you've been reading that um, uh, says, OK, to have an independent civil service and to have a permanent and independent service, um, you have to give them clear salaries, you have to give them a job for life so that they're not amenable to bribes, and you have to capture a certain type of administrator, a type of gentleman, ideally, a gentleman who could be trusted with the secrets of the state and who could be trusted to act in a disinterested public way. Now, in fact, the recommendations of the North Australian report about open competition, about an open exam, aren't introduced until 1870. But these ideas are very important to the reform and restructuring of the civil service in the 1860s and, and the 1850s and the 1860s. It just so happens that what you do is ha create a new type of caste. So if the old sons of the aristocrats and their patrons and their, and their uh, clients were part of the old corrupt system, now what you have is a new caste, which were Oxford and Cambridge educated gentlemen, primarily educated in the liberal arts and primarily classics. So in 1914, the very elite part of that civil service, the first division um, uh, administrators, 78% of them came from Oxford and Cambridge, and 60% of them had read classics. These were the masters of the universe who could survey all types of knowledge. Underneath them, were about 6,000 specialists, engineers, people like inspectors, who would go around with expert professional knowledge, like chemists and engineers, those types of people. And then underneath them, you would have about 3,000 um, uh, junior clerks whose job was to basically shift paper. So you have basically the recreation of a class society within the very structure of the state, of the, a sort of gentlemanly aristocracy, but now mandated by an Oxford education, specialists, middle class professionals, and then uh, uh, the clerks, the sort of effectively the manual laborers of the state. And here you see a, a great image of them at work in um, the um, 1890s in a giant room. 
boy clerks, they, most of them were boys, um, uh, uh, and they were thrown out at age 20 unless they passed um, a, an exam that enabled them to become a permanent um, uh, civil servant. Now, the problem with hiring these types of people, processing all of that data that they were getting from all of those statistics and all of those government officers and inspectors all around the country, was that suddenly these people, these basically effectively you know, lower middle class clerks, were now trusted with the secrets of the state. And the issue was, could you have the key data of the government passing through these types of people? So, what they do in 1911 is introduce the Official Secrets Act, because it's at that point that they believe that the idea of honourable secrecy, that gentlemen and people trained in a gentlemanly way would keep the, the state secrets to themselves, uh, no longer seem to be held true because of the scale of the data and the scale of the people they had to employ. Right. You can stop writing now, I'm just going to show you a bunch of pretty pictures for a little bit. This leads to the transformation of the centre of, um, of government, Whitehall. Um, uh, this is Trafalgar Square. At the top of it, uh, I've turned these images around. At the top here, you have Trafalgar Square. Ah, up there, you have the Houses of Parliament. Okay, this is Whitehall. This is the heart of the government machine in London. Here, you see an image in 1764. You'll note that these whole network of streets basically gets eradicated in um, the middle of the um, uh, 19th century. And this area here becomes the so-called Victoria Embankment. They basically fill in the Thames to be able to house all of these new government offices, which included new um, Scotland Yard. So in other words, what I'm saying is this collection of all of this data, this hiring of all of these people, required the creation of a whole new material infrastructure to house these people and to represent the authority of the state. So all the big government departments that you now you would see if you drove down Whitehall or walked down Whitehall were all built in the second half of the 19th century. Um, uh, the Victoria Embankment um, came in 1870. The removal of these um, extra uh, things in uh, King Street and Parliament Square came in 1873. Then you had the Home and Colonial Office built in the 1870s, New Scotland Yard in the 1880s, the Admiralty Extensions with Admiralty Arch um, uh, in the 1890s, and the Treasury um, in 1898, the War Office in 1899, um, and so on and so on. And Downing Street, where the Prime Minister lives, which I think is this street here, um, uh, became the official residence of the Prime Minister in 1885. What these buildings did was project not just hold the bureaucratic space of the state, they projected the authority. This is the Houses of Parliament, rebuilt in Gothic style after the, a fire had destroyed the old Houses of Parliament in 1834, and it's built in this historical style to try and summon up the idea that English democracy isn't actually invented in the 1830s as it was, but stretched all the way back to the deep medieval past. Then the Houses of Parliament becomes the site for a whole new set of ceremonies, of state ceremonies, like the opening, uh, the, the uh, monarchical opening of the Houses of, of Parliament. Uh, you, you see here Queen Victoria um, at the state opening of Parliament in 1852, a, a, new, a new ceremony invented by uh, the Victorian monarchy. You see here the Foreign Office, the grandeur of the Foreign Office. There was a huge argument about whether they build this in classical style or, or, or in Gothic style, whether it should be something indigenous, supposedly in the Gothic style, or, or, or ape the imperial splendor of ancient Rome. And as you see, the classical style eventually wins out with the Treasury in the 1890s, and here um, my favorite building, the War Office, uh, built in the first five years of the 20th century. This building has over 1,000 offices and two and a half miles of corridor. I mean, it's, it really is a, um, a phenomenal uh, space. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that this new type of bureaucratic machine that is the, is the, is the, is the state also has this profoundly symbolic um, role in the heart of London. Now, I'm going to try and put some flesh on all of these um, uh, rather abstract bones by talking about two case studies so you can see how these new structures of government actually work in practice. And I'm going to talk about the new poor law first, and then I'm going to talk about the introduction of public health measures. Before I do that, I should emphasize that these are both measures and systems introduced in Britain. There are a plethora of new systems that are introduced in many colonial settings. The rationalization of taxation systems, of property law, of penal systems, of educational systems. I could give you many examples of those happening basically around the same type of time in places like India and Ireland uh, especially. I'm not going to do that, partly because I don't have enough time, partly because the ways in which those systems get introduced are, even though they look often like similar systems, they're introduced in radically different types of ways. And one of the reasons why they look radically different is because, well, two reasons. One is they have to be designed in a way that is seen to be appropriate for colonial subjects who are less developed and less civilized. And they are implemented in radically different ways, often far more coercive ways, because there is no representative system. They have to be answerable to no one in the same type of way as, they, as you'll see they have to be in Britain. Nonetheless, with these two examples, the new poor law and public health, Britain actually comes first. So Ireland doesn't get its poor law until 1837, whereas Britain gets it, its in 1834. Um, uh, India never gets one, uh, for reasons that will become apparent in a later lecture. Um, and public health measures, are again, happen later in Ireland and very, very much later in India. Um, and we're talking um, uh, the 1870s and 1880s as opposed to the 1840s. So let's move on to the first one of these case studies, the um, uh, new poor law. And I'm sure in your coffeehouse discussions and sections, you will have addressed Malthus's view on poor relief. Okay? Malthus was fiercely opposed to the poor laws. He basically saw them as generating, not ending, dependence. They, they, they al allowed paupers to basically supplement their, uh, their wages and was a deterrent to, um, uh, to true industrious and independent um, behaviour. Jeremy Bentham is also very interested in the poor laws. Everybody in 18, late 18th century Britain is, <laughs> is interested in, in the poor laws because poverty has become, uh, and the drain of...